народну депутатку України, членкиню МФО «Рівні можливості», голову МФО «Україні Євроатлантичний простір», голову підкомітету з питань безпеки державних інформаційних систем Комітету Верховної Ради України з питань національної безпеки і оборони. А також представляємо вам спікерів та спікерок дискусійної платформи. Степан Полторак, міністр оборони України. Yes, and farmer. Infantry. Valeria Parada, Lieutenant Colonel, Third Secretary of the Defense Section of Ukraine's Mission in the NATO, first peace, uh, woman peacekeeper in the Ukraine. Good afternoon. So let's get started with this panel. It is Women Peace Security. I'm positive that women are the link capable of taking care of any conflict. They can become a part of the process which would not allow the conflict to happen. This panel will be provided by fellow colleague Mariyanova, who moderate the second part of this discussion. In this part, let's walk to Mariyanova first. Feminine peacekeeper. So in this first portion, we're going to address the existing restrictions in the Ukraine when it comes to gender rights in the sector of security and defense. We're going to try and discuss topical issues faced by the women in the Ukrainian military. What keeps them from moving up their career as they are a part of the military and we're going to try and look at the priority nature of the kinds of things that we can do in the legislative field and in the political field. So with this, let's watch the video from the Equal Opportunities Caucus which is devoted to the second panel. In the world, there is a division of professions, right, and duties between men and women. Who can plan a particular profession? If it's a profession of the military, what issues are faced by military women? No equal rights when they choose education, with a special military training. A limited number of military positions in the future. The difference of status of positions between men and women in the military as they grow in their career. There are certain ways of enabling equal rights for them both in this sector. The priority activity line in the Ukraine for 2018 is to look into the practices of NATO member states and put those standards and practices into life in this country. of the defense sector should consider differences in both sexes. For example, the resolution 1325, which was passed unanimously by the UN Defense and Security Council in 2000, on the 31st of October. Active women's participation is a prerequisite for peace and security. There are four major reasons which enter in the above resolution. Wholesome involvement and representation of men and women across the board in decision-making process in the defense sector, protecting the women's girls' rights in the, in the course of the conflicts and post-conflict situations. Gender perspective and women's involvement should help prevent conflicts from happening. Access to health services and mental health in case of trauma. In February of 2016, the Ukraine best a rational action plan in persons of the resolution 1325. Is the Ukraine ready for the profession of the military woman? 
is the Ukraine ready for the military war profession? Going by the numbers, I can say that there have been positive trends. In 2013, the number of women in the army was 47,000. Right now, it is more than 55,000. The officers that serve in the Ukrainian army are 3,100 women that are officers in the army. There has been an increase in the number of surgeons by 73% compared to 2013. So back in 2013, we had nearly 3,200 of them. Right now it is 5,200. So there is a growth in the number of students, feminine students that are capable of getting trained in the universities and also they complete military training. That's quite some progress, but is that enough? I typically believe that it's never enough, so we have to strive for more. So I'm honored to turn over to the Minister of Defense, the Pan Polterak Army General. He is the person and under his guidance in the ministry there have been positive changes. Gently with the members of Equal Opportunities Caucus, we have been honored to organize roundtables in the Defense Ministry. And following that, there have been changes made to the ordinance, and there has been 63 subjects added to the surgeons and officers that are women that are now capable of serving in the army. And as far as I can see, work is in progress to offer more positions to feminine officers in the army. So over to Stefan. Good afternoon, uh, dear friends. As you know, the armed forces and the f the armed forces is of a female gender, so we cannot say that we have to say that a female personnel has to be absolutely equal, has to be absolutely ready to perform its obligations, service obligations. Of course, the responsibilities and obligations have certain risks, have certain uh, difficulties. At the same time, the experience that we have gathered from 2014 proved that from the very first day of Russian aggression, female personnel was always close was always shoulder to shoulder to male service personnel. Uh, they were, some of them were mobilized and uh, together with the male service personnel, they performed all the service obligations as required at that time, even when the armed forces of Ukraine, when they were not ready to accept women as snipers, as drivers, as recon officers, I would like to say today that in the course of combat operations over 6,000 female service personnel were participating in the combat operations. 107 received public decorations. Around 3,000 were decorated by the Minister of Defense or the Chief of General Staff. Unfortunately, three female personnel were killed while protecting our homeland and I believe that it would be very good if we would introduce a moment of silence in respect of them. Please take your seats. Well, uh, you know, just uh, well from the very beginning of aggression and over the three and a half years of this combat operation, we have faced with this problem, the problem that has been uh, created, has been existing for all uh, of our life when if it was difficult for a female personnel to become a military, to become promoted, or there was certain discrimination with 
regards to the uh, positions or educational possibilities at operational or strategic level. Nowadays, Ukrainian forces, the Ministry of Defense, uh, took a very serious commitment and accepted a very important document, which is a strategic defense bulletin, and it clearly delineates our plans and programs with regards to the development of the armed forces, with regards to the reform process, and uh, uh, some of our work and some of our program, of course, considers the uh, female personnel as one of the priorities. I've already given you some numbers. 55,600 female personnel are currently uh, operating in the Ministry of Defense in the Armed Forces. That is 20% of the total manpower. Is that enough or no? Well, my personal idea is that we should not discuss this issue. I mean, whether we have sufficient female personnel or no. There has to be uh, volunteers, uh, there has to be female personnel ready to serve in the armed forces of Ukraine. We have to create, firstly, the preconditions for their service. And just this year we have uh, made a decision to uh, increase the number of positions for female personnel, and today all combat positions uh, that previously were not to be manned by the female personnel. Now they have the possibility to be uh, promoted to these positions. Now the girls, uh, after graduating the secondary school or after graduating from other educational institutions, they can get enrolled into military educational institutions. There are no limitations. There is a mentality for the girls, for female personnel to take this decisions when we are afraid of the difficulties as related to the uh, education of the female personnel, but they prove with, your own, with their own desire, with their own work, that they deserve this education. They can fulfill the obligations, service obligations at the level of uh, the male personnel. And so we're able not to limit the number of female personnel that can be operating in the armed forces of Ukraine and I'd like to take this opportunity and express the words of gratitude uh, to uh, the female members of Parliament uh, who step for uh, the females to provide equal possibilities and opportunities for the female service personnel in the armed forces of Ukraine. They've even prepared a draft law to resolve all those issues and challenges. And, uh, I do hope that Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine this year or maybe uh, during the next year will be able to adopt this law. This is something that the armed forces really needs. And over my 34 years of service, I never had any troubles uh, with uh, the operations of the female service personnel. They were always excellent in performing their duties. And I believe that we should further increase the military occupational specialities. We should create equal opportunities, uh, both in the course of career, but there has to be equal opportunities with regards to the military uniform, with regards to the accommodation, uh, with regards to the equal conditions for career, and we know how to do that. We've uh, already has, have uh, uh, set an objective for us. We need to complete the reform in the MOD by 2020. And this is a challenge for us, but we've already started to resolve uh, this challenge. And I, I know I can see how this could be done. I'm an advocate of equal possibilities and right possibilities. And I have no doubt that these objective may be resolved and it should be resolved. The female service personnel is a, a success of a future armed forces and I'm very grateful for your attention. Mr. Minister, do not hang up the microphone. I have a question for you. There is a resolution of uh, the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine as of 1999, which limits the possibility of females to uh, get enrolled into military lyceums. 
uh, do you wish to uh, cancel this limitations, allowing female to be enrolled in the lyceums? Well, uh, you know, I believe that this uh, issue is mostly of a uh, mil uh, Ministry of Education, because our lyceums, they are under the Ministry of Education, but as the Minister of Defense, as a military, I fully support and I can be an initiator of introducing amendments to this resolution of the Cabinet of Ministers because we should start resolving this problem from the very beginning. Well, thank you very much for your desire uh, of, uh, and, of, uh, and your role in the gender rights and equality. What is your attitude uh, towards the introduction of uh, the, uh, the position for advisor on gender issues in the Ministry of Defense? Well, uh, you know, we have uh, quite a lot of advisors in the Ministry of Defense. In fact, I'm trying to calculate right now. I think we have around 65 advisors, both from NATO, from the countries assisting us in the reform process. Well, I'm supporting the idea of uh, having the deputy minister as a female, and I do have a lot of uh, uh, female advisors. Well, we do hope to see the deputy minister as a female, as well as the first female general. Now, before giving the floor to our uh, next speaker, I'd like to cite the uh, words of the first uh, four-star general from U.S. Earlier, always, almost 98% of uh, service personnel believe that the best job for women is the, to be a cook. Nowadays, uh, there are radical changes in the armed forces of the United States because uh, there were uh, laws imposed that uh, eradicate all limitations with regards to the service possibilities and career possibilities for the female. So it is my pleasure to pass the floor to the general from the United States. In the room of so many accomplished women coming together, there's truly an energy when when we come in one place with a single uh, with a single vision, and I think it's really an unstoppable. Are there to help mentor women as they come up through the ranks because there aren't um, women. You know, for, for the trailblazing uh, ones who are coming through as first lieutenants and, and captains and sergeants, they need to have a, a senior mentors to help support them as they work through. So it really is a case of men and women working together. The final, uh, final comment I have uh, is that as we look at uh, what I would think what I consider best practices. You know, I look at the United States Air Force, and we have benefited in our last two secretaries of the Air Force have been women. And Secretary James, particularly, was very cognizant because she approves all, uh, all general officers, male or female, uh, they're promoted, uh, recommended for promotion within the Air Force. She approves those lists. So she would look at those lists, and she would look for representation, and she would challenge the decision makers to say, are we, are we excluding women uh, from this set of future leaders that we have within our military? We also, uh, had a very forward-thinking general, uh, General uh, uh, George C. Marshall, who was, among other things, the Secretary of Defense back in the mid-1950s. And in the mid-1950s, he established an organization called the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Services. The committee, which is called DACOWITS, is men and women who are appointed by the Secretary of Defense to provide advice and recommendations on matters and policy relating to the recruitment and retention, treatment, employment, integration, and well-being of highly qualified professional women in the armed forces. So this organization was formed in the mid-1950s, or early 1950s. Uh, it's a civilian organization. There are no mil active military members who are part of it, although there are former military me members who are part of it, men and women. And men 
many of those changes that we've seen in the military over the years have been a uh, direct result of DECOWITS uh, providing those recommendations to the Secretary of Defense for change. So uh, that's all the uh, uh, formal remarks I have for this portion, uh, but I would like to say again thank you for being here. It's been uh, truly an honor to be in such an august group of, uh, of women, and I look forward to your questions. Дякуємо, мадам Доун. Є репліка від міністра оборони України. Дякую, колега. Я дуже вважаю, що ви сказали. Це добре відповідь для нас. Я хочу сказати всім жінкам, які живуть в Україні, що це не так добре з нас зараз, як це було з вами в 1970 роках. Speaking of delivering a baby, taking a baby break, well, right now the woman in the military in this country can have a baby without quitting her service. And after that, she won't have to quit. She will preserve her place in the army. And uh, the woman is free to decide when to come back from the baby break, in a month, two, or maybe three years. So I'm fully supportive uh, what you said. This matter should be taken care of and we're going to keep on this way. Speaking of training, in the existing academies and universities, we have some universities of the tactical level and they teach 533 women, young ladies, in the tactical academy and strategic academy, they teach more than 20. So we're making progress with this. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Back in 2005, in the delegation of the National Defense and Security Council, I went to Iraq and they presented to me an officer that was a woman. And when we spoke, I could see that she had three babies. And I was wondering, how do you do with them? She said, it's my choice, it's my life. So she's aware that she will face certain restrictions as a mother if she chooses to serve in the army, to work in the army. And there is a draft law in the parliament, 6109. Irina Suslova will tell us more about that in subsequent panels. The idea behind the draft is that armed forces should be free from some remaining discrimination. Women can make a contract in the army, then we need to take care of their pension and career growth and promotion. So there are things we can take care of together. With this, I'd like to turn over to the Brigadier General Ingrid Gerda. In Norway, back in 1985, they removed any limits for women which would choose to serve in the army. Would you please share some of that experience and tell us where it's at with the Norwegian army right now and what can we possibly learn from your experience? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. It's a great inspiration to be here today. Norway has a long history of uh, gender and uh, women's rights issues, and it's continuously up to debate. And as a military leader, it's my responsibility to make sure that both men and women in our units are re uh, treated equally. I'm also a mother of a son and a daughter, and uh, I would never accept my daughter not to be handled with the same respect and the same opportunities as my son, as long as she was up to the standards. For our armed forces, gender is not only about quality, it's even more about operational effectiveness. And therefore, and I think this is also the main issue with UN Resolution 1325. It's about operational value to succeed in operations. 
можна було досягнути успіхів у військових операціях за кордоном. Також ми маємо проводити аналітику по цьому питанні в Норвегії. Ми це розуміли для того, щоб повторювати майбутнє мовлення, а також це можна просто сміти і фотосіпатися. We have several units with 50% men and women to look how this works. We also have in the special forces a particular female platoon. And it's very interesting to see that in some matters they do better than the similar male platoon with exactly the same requirements. For instance, in firing, and also when it comes to, um, it comes to um, reports, they have better results. We also have a gender responsive communication and marketing plan. And since 2010, the armed forces have applied a unique campaign which emphasizes ethical values as well as smart minds and brain power more than machines, actions and adventure. And the campaign has been widely praised. Gender perspective is also a vital part of our leadership development. The Chief of Defense has an annual uh, gender equality conference, and we also produce doctrines, handbooks, and so on in order to use використовувати це те, це все у військовій системі освіти, щоб це було для жінок і для чоловіків доступно, щоб вони відповідно ставилися до цього питання і вірно до нього ставилися. Також у нас є національний план по жінкам в безпеці і в цілому завдання ставиться таке. Безпека, права і потреби жінок та чоловіків мають братися до уваги у всіх аспектах які є дотичними до національних операцій. І цей план включає в себе операційне планування і виконання, вибудову компетенцій і набір до лав армії. The Nordic Center for Gender and Military Operations in Sweden, which is the NATO department um, head on gender perspective in operations. And also in our military defense college, we have a project where there are two full-time working on these gender topics. The action plan also uh, promotes recruitment of women to international operations. And I'm very proud to tell that we have the first female uh, head of UNICEP, Cyprus, that's Brigadier, no, uh, General uh, Kristin Lund. And she is actually now just started as the head of UNSO, Middle East. So we succeed in picking the right ones and, and uh, have been able to compete on the very top level positions for the women, I'm proud to tell. Yeah, I could say a lot about recruitment, lots of discussions, whether we should have specific, specific shares or not. And for the moment, we do not have specific shares of so women. Uh, at the same time, it's important for us to make our leaders responsible. And I, I think they, uh, we, we all are very much aware of that. In 2016, just a year ago, Norway 
Norway, uh, started yeah. universal yeah. conscription. Yeah. We still have conscription, and now it's universal, yeah. which yeah. means that yeah. all men yeah. and women yeah. uh, are uh, have mandatory conscription, yeah. which we think yeah. also yeah. will um, will influence yeah. the numbers yeah. of NCOs yeah. and, uh, um, and yeah. officers yeah. in the future. Yeah. And this is not done for gender equality. It's mainly done to make sure that the armed forces are best possible suited for future uh, operations and missions. Yes, we have persistent focus on ethics, attitudes and conducts. I've mentioned the service. I can also mention what's done in the education system and the focus in the units. Uh, and also when it comes to preventing sexual harassments and su such issues, that's also very often up on the table in our in education systems and, uh, and in the units. We have very clear polities. But also in Norway, I have to admit, we have our issues and we have to, have to take every single one seriously. My impression is that most army leaders are responsible and, uh, and take care because they are very much uh, exposed to their responsibilities through political policies, speeches, education system, training for operations, and more than all, their experience, very positive experience with universal conscription now and with women in all ranks. The Norwegian defense, and now, I, now I'm going to quit soon, uh, also have a network for female NCOs and officers, which I think is very important, both to put these issues on the table, but also as a great support to those who are, uh, what should I say, the pioneers in all kinds of positions. Uh, they encourage women on every level to apply for the hard positions and support in um, uh, all manners of, uh, of gender issues. As you hear, I think Norway has come very far when it comes to gender. But when that said, we still have a long way to go, and as was mentioned here earlier, we never can drop the guard, and I think coming here, listening and talking to you is one of the, the things that can be done to make sure that we are improving also for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tell me, please, how many years are now Скільки ж зараз перебуває жінок в лавах Збройних сил Норвегії? Хоча б в процентному співвідношенні. Скільки жінок перебуває сьогодні в Збройних силах Норвегії? Хоча б в процентному співвідношенні. Yeah, I think after we opened the Після universal того, як ми відкрили last year, it was 27% female soldiers the very first year, and it's increasing. When it comes to the other ranks, it's uh, а по інших посадах це буде 15, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, Ну, ми всі розуміємо, що з огляду на те, що пріоритетом нашої зовнішньої політики вже Euro-Atlantic integration and involvement of women on equal terms with men in the armed forces in NATO member states is a priority for the NATO member states. I'd like to turn over now to the Colonel, Deputy Commander of the School of Military Police of the U.S. Infantry, Eugene Gilmartin. Good afternoon. Such a very important forum. I, I also want to thank, on behalf of my boss, uh, the Commandant of the Military Police School, uh, Brigadier General Donna Martin, who's also a woman general officer. 
Uh, it is a privilege and it's an honor to meet you all, and uh, I take this opportunity to share my individual perspective on women and security. Uh, while I may reference some Army programs and some defense data, these ideas are, are just my own, and uh, I look forward to talking to you about them later. I joined the United States Army 24 years ago. My mother was in the Air Force. She was one of those who actually had to get out when she got pregnant. Uh, but throughout my career, I've embraced the two roles of a military police officer, the role of an army officer, and also the role of a police officer. I've served both in the United States and overseas a variety of missions, highway regulation, convoy operations in the Balkans, deterrence operations in South Korea, detainee operations and corrections advisory missions in Iraq, and police training in Afghanistan. So through it all, I've been encouraged by the steady progress and the opportunities for women. And I see the most hope, I'm going to have to juggle these. See, I wrote it really big this time. I see the most hope when I'm wearing uh, my army hat when I'm thinking about myself as the role of a soldier, as the expression goes. In 2017, for example, there's no longer any primary branch or specialty that's closed to women, and that opens tremendous opportunities for those who want to push themselves to the limit. I was recently at our service academy at West Point, and I saw women who were selected as infantry officers and armor officers. Those two branches were exclusively male when I was a young lieutenant. Thank you, ma'am. We now have women enlisted soldiers in these branches as well, and I have no doubt that in the upcoming years our formations will become automatic with integrated operations. After all, many of the seasoned combat veterans' men that have already served with women have worked with them either attached or adjacent on the battlefield. Additionally, we've had increased the opportunity for women to train. The military police have been fully integrated since the late 1970s when the Women's Army Corps, the WAC, was disbanded. We really got a 30-year head start on a lot of other specialties since the military police and the WAC were both in the same state of Alabama. It was lucky geography. Indeed, in 1978, it was an MP, a military police, Major General Mary Clark, who became the first woman to achieve the rank of any service in two-star and to command a military installation. In 2015, therefore, it was no surprise to me that one of two women to pass the rigorous U.S. Army Ranger School was an MP, a military police officer, along with a combat aviator. Today, the list of training opportunities for women in the U.S. is extensive, including Combat Engineer Staffer School, the MP Special Reaction Team course, Explosive Ordnance Training, among many others. So as our assignments and training have advanced, so too have our support programs. The U.S. Army employs athletic and performance trainers, nutritionists, and specialty physicians to address most concerns that would limit women. The Defense Department has even been discussing pilot programs in preserving fertility to allow men who may be at risk of serious injury to later have children, and also to allow women who may take on a physically arduous assignment the opportunity to delay motherhood. These are all welcome changes. As I see it, we are now moving closer to true equality of participation, where the will, desire, qualification, heart, and guts matter. But this is not to suggest that every individual can accomplish every mission in the U.S. Army. Warfare is and always has been a team sport, as you know. Additionally, physiology and kinesiology, how the body is built and how the body moves, it still matters. After all, it is very unlikely that I will ever approach two meters tall. It's also very, very unlikely that I will ever be able to run five kilometers in under 15 minutes. And for that reason, I really, really love the military police armor security vehicle because it can make me go very fast. The body matters, but I think in all other ways, there's great optimism in the progress of the U.S. Army for women in security. As I mentioned earlier, however, I wear two hats. I wear the Army helmet and also the cap of a police officer. And it is when I see the world as a police officer, and I saw some of my Ukrainian police sisters here earlier, that's where I still am very concerned. I'm concerned about protection, protection of women, of men, of children, and of vulnerable populations, and I know that you are too. 
You may have been watching recent news stories about sexual harassment and sexual assault in Hollywood and other public and private sectors in the United States. The Department of Defense has made progress fighting both sexual assault and sexual harassment in the past decade, but we can always get better. This month, the Defense Department released its annual report on sexual assault in the military for fiscal year 2016, and this was released publicly. Overall, 4.3% of active duty women and 0.6% of active duty men indicated that they had experienced a sexual assault in the prior year. This is a statistically significant decrease from the 2014 study, but it is still too high. Reporting of the most psychologically damaging events is also up, a good thing. In the 2016 data, about one in three service members reported their sexual assault, as contrasted with only one in four in 2014 and one in 14 in 2006. This defense data seems to reflect what I personally have seen as a commander and also as a law enforcement officer. We have more soldiers reporting attacks, such as abusive sexual contact, that may have been brushed off by victims in the past as part of the culture. I see more male victims reporting. I see more reports of distant events that even predate military service. And I see more bystanders coming forward to talk about sexual harassment of their friends and colleagues. Overall, confidence in the system is slowly and steadily going up. And still, I worry. I worry because offenders know the myths and misperceptions that we all carry. They often handpick their victims, those who could easily be discredited, who no one will believe. They pick the new soldier, the soldier who's already in trouble, the promiscuous or over-sexualized soldier, or the soldier who is a past victim. On that, the predators always seem to know. So if leaders are not careful, we'll miss opportunities and we'll miss those victims and deny them the opportunity to report and become healthy survivors. They will hide. They'll be afraid of discipline for minor misconduct. They may be ashamed and they may be in denial. That's what I worry about as a police officer. I also am deeply concerned on the broader exploitation and human trafficking we see at home and abroad when we're deployed. And this, again, will come as no surprise to this distinguished group. You're well aware how often vulnerable populations are sold into sexual exploitation, refugees, the impoverished, the mentally disabled, those addicted, and those caught in a cycle of exploitation since childhood. These crimes proliferate during conflict when security is focused on warring factions. In the United States, many police departments have changed strategy on human sexual trafficking. Sex workers are less often prosecuted and instead taken to services to assist with jobs or addiction. Some are returned, if they're young, to a trustworthy relative. Many police chiefs have declared war on the traffickers, focusing exclusively on pimps and high-level criminals, using intelligence they've gathered from those that traffic. And I'm encouraged by these developments. However, the terrain has changed since I became a military police officer. Technology has two sides. The technology that provides more opportunity for women to contribute to national defense also has a dark side, and you likely have seen it in your own country too. Ungoverned cyberspace, the dark web, offering a vast marketplace of child exploitation images, illegal services, drugs and weapons, which always seem to disproportionately hurt our most vulnerable. Security professionals must ensure that they're patrolling these virtual neighborhoods and alleys as much as they patrol their own land, and I've spent a lot of time doing this recently. Since 2017, it seems that almost every investigation I review or work on has a digital component. It has photographs, records of chats, all with their own language. And effective protection requires learning those terms and phrases. I could buy a phrase book to learn a couple of phrases for the Ukraine, but is there a phrase book that tells everyone how to investigate cyberspace? There are, but it changes daily. So in order to be effective security professionals, we need to really understand that terrain. So these are the dueling worlds that I'm living in right now, Army soldiering and policing. And there's a both optimism and concern for the future in those roles. There is a lot of uncertainty, but I'm certain about two things. One, the most 
most effective militaries leverage all talent and they maximize the contributions of all soldiers and civilians regardless of gender. Two, I'm sure that being a global security professional requires protecting vulnerable populations to defeat enemy forces and promote peace. So these are a few things I've been thinking about recently, but I'm very, very honored, very humbled to be here with you today. I look forward to talking Thank you, Eugenia. I wish I could ask you a question now, but no time right now. I'm getting a drift of the schedule. I'd like to turn over to the first woman peacekeeper in the Ukraine, Lieutenant Colonel, Third Secretary of the Defense Mission of the Ukraine and NATO, Valeria Prada. Uh, good afternoon, everybody here. I'm glad for this opportunity to uh, exchange my experience today. After Ukraine received its independence, many of our women decided to self-actualize in the military. I'm one of those women. Uh, my fate is tied to the army by my decision, which I took in 1997. And despite the complications, the conditions, the lack of the conditions sometimes, I didn't change my decision. Uh, and I've been in the army for 20 years. And you know that our armed forces since uh, independence actively take part in international operations to support peace and security in different uh, regions of the world, in the Balkans, in Africa, in the Middle East, and it uh, just so happened that as the beginning of my service, my functional duties were related to preparing, to training uh, service persons to take part in these international operations. And I also uh, uh, wrote a report to send it to a peacekeeping mission, and I was supported by everyone who had sent a decision, by that, uh, including the Minister of Defense. In 2002, I went to the uh, temporary uh, forces HQ in uh, Le Le Lebanon to fulfill my duties there. I had to learn many new things, uh, this is of which I didn't uh, know before. I managed to do that. I was. Uh, I was motivated not by ambitions, but because I had to fulfill my duties. This was a president. It was the first time I went to a, a UN mission HQ, and uh, I had to prove that I could do it, and I did. Uh, the next uh, places of service were uh, Iraq but I'm not the one with three children, where I took part in the civil and military direction department. And then in 2009, I went to Kosovo, where I was planning informational operations. And these very issues which are currently uh, called, uh, referred to as strategic communication, also uh, fulfill the position as the representative in the HQ, and every mission experience is very different, and for me, is very important. I always use my, in my service, this experience, which also helped me to fulfill missions in the HQ of the anti-terrorist operation in the East of Ukraine. My first example in Lebanon gave positive consequences. Women started to be directed as military observers in the UN missions. They started to serve in our peacekeeping uh, divisions, and then they were started to be sent in more serious structures. And recently, my colleague retailed from Brussels, uh, Colonel Ella Variska, who has been for the last several years performing her part in the military representation of the mission if you play in NATO, I would also like to speak of, uh, briefly about the gender issue in international operations in Lebanon 2002. I was surprised to find out that in battalions of uh, Ghana, as I'm for friend, uh, armed forces, India, France, Poland, quite a lot of women are there, and all categories of women are there. Soldiers, surgeons, officers, uh, take part in patrols, uh, responsible for 
logistics for medical provision, and Iraq I saw American divisions had many military service women who perform fight together with men in Kosovo in the Greek battalion. There were female soldiers and surgeons. The head of one of the Scandinavian battalions was a uh, a woman, it's also important to note that in missions, uh, men and women relationships are built on mutual military principles of subordination, di discipline, HQ culture, restraint, and it's not always quite, quite so positive, and sometimes there are but issues due to personal relationships and the sexual uh, harassment that also happens but the national contingents and mission HQs work is being done on this all of the time and these issues as far as I know are also being raised all of the time on all levels in UN, in NATO right now our Ukrainian women are actively participating in this uh, list of opposition, they command military machines, snipers, uh, operators of uh, anti-tank uh, equipment, and they see their dedication, their efforts, and they see that they won't be disappointed in time, that they won't abandon the military service and become the next generation of real military professionals. Which my speech, I'd like to say that I'm thankful to my army for the opportunity to self-actualize, to use my talent, my knowledge. Thanks to the army, I managed to see the world. I've received unique experience, not just as a peacekeeper, but military in general, and just general experience life experience. I met unique people from all countries, different continents, and I believe this is very important as well. I don't think that I did a quite a high uh, career, but I believe that I'm on my place in the Army. I've dedicated myself to development, to development of the armed forces, and I see positive results of my work. There are officers and sergeants. Uh, uh, speak English confidently, and our divisions show high results in international uh, trainings, I see myself like a happy mother to many, to many talented children with, in whose development and learning I took a part. I'm proud of them, of, of all of my boys. No personal achievements in army are not are nothing if you didn't teach this to someone else. And you didn't be any work closer to their professional government. Ms. Valeri, there is one question. How many, for how many years have you been a. Uh, in, in your. well, six years. Six years. Six, six, yeah. You know, really, it's very n nice when you visit such events, listen to your subordinates and understand how much they have done and how important is the military service for them and how much efforts and health they dedicate to make it possible for the armed forces to be stronger and successful for the armed forces to protect our country in full. While I was listening to Valeria, we had like a, a little uh, bet with uh, Irina, how much was she in the service six years, and I now make the decision to give her the order of the rank of time. Thank you for this trust and for this highest estimation of my daily work. It is unseen because I'm 
somewhere far away in Jitomer. I've been for the last several years, but I know that right now in my place there is another officer who is also every day walks uh, to their best, calls me all the time, consults, asks important questions, other colleagues from the general HQ, and uh, I understand the time required as a specialist, and I promise that the next 10 years, because my contract is for the next 10 years, has been signed for the next 10 years, I hope that I will last that long. The contract was signed. This is for me also a, an insurance of sorts that I will serve and every day I will try to be, first of all, an example to other women who uh, come to service. Not, not an example, I'm one of many. Fortunately, there are many women like me. I'm not alone. I want to be useful every day and to be doing my part of the armed forces for them to be Дякуємо. Та панове, дозвольте мені почати з поздоровлення Валерію на спочатку з жінок Кослобучу Петерсидилова. А в Україні, коли прибула сюди два половини року тому, поздравляю, ви цього заслужили. Я вам дякую. Дякую. Women, Peace and Security Agenda, and among those were, of course, the continuous impunity for conflict-related sexual violence against women and girls. There's still very marginal participation of women, not only in the peace talks, but also in the security and defense and law enforcement sectors. Uh, it's quite frequent uh, across uh, the whole, uh, across all the countries uh, in the whole world that uh, quite often participation of women in the security and defense is still considered as either tick the box or very marginal agenda, not worth of attention, and I am happy to hear from our uh, distinguished Minister of Defense that uh, the Ministry of, uh, Minister, uh, Ministry of Defense of Ukraine is giving appropriate attention to this issue. Uh, Ukraine is no exception, unfortunately, still women do uh, being uh, acknowledged and uh, uh, though their uh, contribution to achieving the peace and security agenda in this country is being acknowledged, still attention is quite marginal, and uh, I am uh, 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 working very closely with so many partners in the government, in the parliament, in the civil society, with the armed forces, I see what a desperate efforts they are making to advance this agenda and what enormous challenges they are facing. Those challenges come from the systemic gender inequality in this country and the comprehensive gender discrimination which they have to overcome to advance this agenda. However, I have been privileged and delighted to work with so many partners coming from different sectors of this society in the government, in the parliament, again, I will repeat, the civil society, because uh, it, it is... Um because they made this women, peace and security agenda a permanent agenda of their daily work, as well as a part of their long-term vision of development of this country, that we have uh, seen that uh, the hard work has resulted in some achievements which we, as the partners of all these people, and the majority of them are women, 
uh, can build our further efforts on. The policy frameworks are there. So we have national action plan, the Ministry of Defense annually adopts its action plan on women, peace and security. The Ministry of Interior has just prepared for adoption the women, peace and security plan for several years. The legislative transformations are uh, being taken place. And again, I would like to commend the efforts of the women members of parliament who are driving this agenda and hopefully by the end of the year we will see the adoption of those laws which will allow women to serve in the army without any restrictions and uh, to enjoy the equal opportunities in the army and uh, environment there. So uh, the Women, Peace and Security agenda, just to conclude, uh, obviously continues to expand its footprint in Ukrainian policy and legislative uh, uh, making. And uh, for us, the partners of the government, of the parliament, of women serving in the armed forces and of the civil society organizations which are advancing this agenda, I would like to suggest that we would shift uh, from the ad hoc conclusion of women in these, uh, in these issues, from the small scale uh, project-based initiatives to towards ensuring that women, peace and security agenda would take a central piece in the reforms, comprehensive, transformative reforms, which the government and women in the government and in the parliament have made their uh, priority. Thank you very much, and again, congratulations, Valeria. Very happy for you. Thank you. Uh, we're sorry that we have uh, spent too much time for this discussion, and right now I was told that two questions top, tops, two questions. We don't have much time. Uh, Mar Marina Stapenka, SBU Colonel. Unfortunately, there are no representatives of the uh, Security service, there is a glass ceiling there for women who move upwards. This glass ceiling is too strong. It's impossible for a woman to become a general. They're just impossible right now. Two women out of 20,000 uh, are generals. Out of for five, four or five years for a man to become a general on this post, you need only two years. A woman may forget to hold a, a dream to become a general. It's impossible. And you may find it funny, but the, we are working with the general issues in this view. But this department is led by a man. And I don't believe that a man will stand for rights of women just the organization of this Congress to propose to include to the declaration mandatory creation of the institution of advisors or uh, president's representative because without impetus this discussion won't start by itself. And another issue is to Mr. Minister. You said that you have over 60 advisors and many uh, deputies and how many of them are women? You know, first of all, I said uh, advisors who work, uh, help to ref reform the armed uh, forces. These are colleagues from other countries, from the alliance, but a lot of women there. Out of strategic advisors, six of them, one of them is women. Out of uh, uh, deputies, I don't have women, and that's why I propose to have one. And, uh, I'm glad that you are very serious about this issue. That's very good, and I believe that a man, if a, a man ever loved in their life, his mother, his wife, his daughter, he will never be stopping a woman from moving up the I think that. All of, you will, all of you will turn out all right for you in the end. I believe this is, first of all, the, sy the system that prevents women from moving upwards on the career ladder, and that's why we have to change not to present as much be these departments, but the system. Another question, please. I'm uh, the head of the uh, National Women's Council of Ukraine. We have an absolutely unbelievable presentation right now, and I would like to finish uh, this current session. Lessons were the same as it should have begun. I would like to remember our boys, which are right now in the ATO. Let us all of this right technology which you have right now on peacekeeping. Let us all unite all of this knowledge. And if you pass at least one decision which will move forward, our will move forward with the issue in the East of Ukraine all together. 
this will be great contribution of our Women's Congress. Thank you very much for your advice. And I have to finish right now because I'm being uh, hurried up. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for our speakers. Thank you to the party. Gentlemen, Дякуємо учасницям та учасникам за цікаву дискусію. Пані Ірині Фріз, дякуємо за модерацію дискусії. Шановні гості, просимо вас залишатися на своїх місцях. Оголошується технічна перерва на 5 хвилин. Пані та панове, просимо вас залишатися на своїх місцях. Оголошується технічна перерва на 5 хвилин. Також повідомляємо, що о 19.30 розпочнуться виступи молодих дівчат-лідерок, які розкажуть своє бачення майбутнього України, інновацій, журналістики та повернення до нормального життя після військових конфліктів. Сесія проходить в рамках менторського проєкту «Я зможу», що реалізується фондом Олени Пінчук та фундацією «Кока-Кола». Модератор – директорка фонду Олени Пінчук Ольга Руднєва. Шановні гості, будь ласка, залишайтеся на своїх місцях. У нас перерва 5 хвилин, не більше. Шановні гості, ще раз просимо вас нікуди не йти, залишатися на місцях. Ми розпочинаємо за декілька хвилин. Шановні гості, запрошуємо вас займати свої місця в залі. Ми розпочинаємо. Шановні гості, запрошуємо вас на свої місця в залі.
Пані та панове, за хвилину розпочинаємо продовження дискусійної платформи. Запрошуємо вас на місця. Шановні пані та панове, продовжуємо засідання другої дискусійної платформи «Жінки. Мир. Безпека». Представляємо модераторку другої частини Марію Іонову, народну депутатку України, співголову міжфракційного депутатського об'єднання «Рівні можливості» у Верховній Раді, а також спікерів та спікерок дискусійної платформи. Отже, Іванна Климпуш-Цинцадзе. I'm turning it over to Maria Yonova. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to continue the panel. And this time we're going to focus on the peacemaking processes. And I'd like to tell you a little story. It's a story of me. It's about examples of peace efforts. It all started over at Maidan. And that's where we saw the role of women and mothers, sisters and everybody else. And in the course of the conflict, they would become between two opposing sides of the conflict when all of the hostilities began. These people were standing between them, trying to make sure there's going to be a dialogue between opposing sides of the conflict. They wanted peace, not bloodshed. They wanted to have a dialogue in between the conflicting parties. We often witnessed women spoke from the stage, they moderated calling vocation we're trying to break these stereotypes in real life and uh, we determine the role of military women women politicians diplomats they represent parties in the main negotiations officers gi people so we can see that these women are mindful of potential results. I'd like to turn over to Ivana now. You worked in the NGO sector, you worked in the legislative branch of the government, now you are in the executive branch. So, do you think there are any advantages that you get for women if they become a part of peace processes? And what do you think are the key challenges in enabling women's involvement in peace processes. Thank you. Thank you for another, another opportunity to join the discussion panel. And prior to answering this question, 
відбулося від того, про що ви говорили, дійсно, напевно, після Майдану жінки також відчули... After Майдан, women have been able to experience a new opportunity and uh, they began volunteering and doing things together. They started joining the ATO units. Also, they have experienced particular signs of discrimination against themselves. And I guess that's why we are not speaking with politicians and we're not just speaking their minds with them. We're not just based on experience of other countries and we're trying to do something in this field for the sake of equal representation of women and men, both in the peace processes and in the sector of security and defense. And in doing so, we have to gain support from somebody, somebody seasoned in this, which allows us to speak more solidly about that. We have seen that there have been cases we're going to take on board necessarily, and since I began coordinating gender policy issues, we checked with the UN women, asking to analyze the gender impact on security and defense sector. And the first part of this discussion has been rather optimistic, but I guess I'm not going to share the best kind of news. But that's where it's at right now. If we look at the way the situation unfolds, it becomes clear that a decision can be made, can be made which will lead to a better result. Now, one of the conclusions that you get from this assessment is that the strategic paper that we have put together, it's a strategic defense bulletin that has been co-drafted with the NATO partners and fellow colleagues from other countries, NATO member states. It is about reforms in the sector, and we have to do a lot of work internally to make it happen, but at the same time, this paper is gender-blind. Sometimes we feel like something's going to give in the defense and security sector in terms of gender equality, but still it has not been able to become a part of the decisions. Some feminine MPs have been able to make certain changes in respective provisions. Some of them serve in the army, some of them serve in the law enforcement sector. So now we need to change these practices and try and offer some extra things which will become a part of this strategic defense bulletin. We also see that Women do not enjoy equal opportunities in the defense and security sector as men, like in terms of access to military education. There is no gender-based education system for all, at least for those that get trained across different stages in the military. And it can be gender-based independence in the war schools or in universities, at the operative and tactical levels and strategic levels. These are the kinds of things that should be modified. We also see that right now we do not get funding for that. 
Виступаючи, говорила про те, що одна з складових успіхів забезпечення гендерної рівності на загал, це є власне фінансування, тобто в секторі безпеки і оборони нам не вистачає специфічного фінансування для того, щоб жінки були представлені рівномірно з чоловіками. Все це є частинами завдань, які ми зараз будемо пробувати змінювати. Things that we were going to take care of the enable changes, so we began drafting the gender equality strategy for the security sector, and I will check with the government about that, I will check with the National Security and Defense Council and the President. There's going to be some reply from them, I guess, and you all are going to help us in this. So that this thing would not be far away from the reality today. We also believe that there is a need to think over the communication strategy where all of the success stories and failures could be addressed. And we could explain this to everybody else to let them see why we are standing out for this. Speaking of peace processes, in many countries' policies, there is a need, a growing need for feminine style in decision making. And this feminine style may be used by men. I can tell you more about this. It is the ability to hear somebody else out. It is the ability to keep in touch with many stakeholders, communities. Zero tolerance to lie and zero to tolerance to injustice. It's like fairness and decency. They can step into somebody else's shoes, and that allows them to size up the situation differently. So that feminine style will make for better peace processes, and there's going to be a way to find the best possible solutions, which could be all right for all parties of the conflict. That's a hard work. Finding a compromise through pain, through accepting somebody else's pain, that's a, a great deal of a thing. And uh, if we are capable of using our soul and the skill in seeking a compromise, then we're going to do better. We're not going to cross the lines we're not supposed to cross. And every woman, I guess, clearly realizes where is that line that cannot be crossed. So if we do it this way, then we're going to be able to make a faster progress towards peace. But having said that, it's not enough just to negotiate things unilaterally. So women should be present on either side of the dialogue. It should be a two-way street. And uh, in our particular case, it doesn't happen. And uh, right now we are backed up against the wall and we cannot uh, really negotiate things in order to bring peace back home and make sure that our loved ones get their homes back and we could regain our land and our citizens. So we are just getting started in this. But in order to make it a success in negotiations, there should be willingness from both parties to go for it. Thank you. You're exactly right. There are certain cultural barriers. Women that are a part of this process have to exert influence on these kinds of decisions. And in this conflict, in this context, when we speak about the consequences of the difficulties in the East, I'd like to check with the minister. I guess over the last three and a half years, he have been in the conflict zone for quite a while. You can see these consequences and as a man of the system, I wonder if you've got a plan, a game plan. Is there any plan in the ministry? Have you elaborated a policy? To help victims of the conflict. It may also entail 
resolving certain specific problems in the course of implementing government policies and services. So the focus is going to be placed on the feminine IDPs. Thank you. There are a few components which I can see in this ongoing conflict. This armed conflict came from outside of the Ukraine, and it happens in order to fire up discord inside the country. And it is done in different ways. Speaking of the RDPs, these are the people which move to the controlled, government-controlled territories in the Ukraine. But very often, these people face a lot of injustice, unfair attitude to themselves, and sometimes they're treated unfairly. So some initiatives get blocked, and conducive environment doesn't take shape. So sometimes there is lack of respective priorities for those people. And women in that setting, it's more than 60% of women in the RDPs in total. So they might have special needs, and we have drafted particular decisions. And in the existing decisions following women's initiatives, we have been able to offer measures that should be taken. And it is actually something that should be done not just by my ministry. We have to pitch in all together because one ministry cannot pull it off. Even if we had a special ministry of gender equality, it would not be able to do good in all of these aspects because it's just not feasible with that situation in place. So there are drafts like that. We enjoy donor's assistance. And if we speak of funding, I can tell you straight in the backboard, maybe the prime minister things differently. But if you say, I need funding for the government program or measures, and I need funding from the national budget in order to train women, and after the training or retraining, they would gain access to another profession, another level, then it would be really hard to do. If you say you need to put asphalt on the road somewhere, it is also hard, but it's more feasible. So sometimes they do not understand that everything should be funded. There are lots of non-material things which are like that, and they are also in need of funding. So if we look at the existing plan of the government, we're going to see a lot of measures in it which are not done, which are done voluntarily, or they're funded by donors. And that means that, firstly, we declare something that's classy. Each strategy features gender equality, equal opportunities for women, but now we need to look for some other measures to see if they're adequately funded. Now there is another component. It's not the IDPs and women. It's about the people that are living now in the government uncontrolled territories. There we can see typically men with guns in their hands fighting against the Ukrainian government. They try to destabilize the situation there across the touchline, along the touchline. They've got families. It's not all right if a mother delivers a baby, a son, and she knows the son will have to be die for an unknown reason. And I guess all of the programs which were supposed to demotivate the combatants which are fighting against Ukraine right now, they should have been targeted at the families of those guys that are militants. In some countries that campaign has paid off, and I would not say it works everywhere. Right now you get such conflicts that do not matter. We've got a conflict which has been caused by the Russian attempts to destabilize things. But there have been examples of internal domestic conflicts in Colombia, for example. They wanted to do the demobilization campaign. There is a FARC organization made up of masculine combatants, and they were focused on mothers. And there was an entire campaign like before 
you were, before you became a combatant, you were my son. And that campaign paid off. And I think these kinds of mechanism, mechanisms have to be employed. Negotiations. I said before that we've got great negotiators that do this on behalf of Ukraine. They're trustworthy. But you get a lot of local initiatives which do not, do not involve women. And sometimes we try and involve women in all sorts of dialogues across all tiers with women from different professions. In other countries, we can see it can work pretty well. And when we speak about tensions between different population groups and uh, the dialogue should happen inside a community, and we can see that very often it pays off if women become a part of this process. We are ready to do better in these initiatives, but I think all respective agencies should be a part of that. We drafted a national program so that it would cover all of the agencies, not just the ministry that I represent. Thank you for that. And when we spoke of challenges, it is clear that we use international best practices and expertise. And we would like to keep to keep on this way. So with this, I'd like to turn over to a great leader, a politician, a diplomat in Kosovo independence, a well-known woman who was the only one peace negotiator in the Balkans trying to stop the war, bringing peace and justice for her home country. Over the last seven years, you have been in charge of negotiations under the Brussels dialogue, so Edita, you're welcome to speak now because we are interested in your experience and uh, in particular the role the women played in the process of switching from a military conflict to peace in the Republic of Kosovo. That includes economic restoration and political settlement. And I would like to say that uh, I would like to say that uh, you, Ukraine, the 21st century, century of women, and we are coming as a emerging force that will change the paradigm of development and democracy in the future. Congratulations. You have moved all government, president, parliament, civil society, and even brought us from the different parts of the world to together try to advance our debate for our goal of empowering women and placing women to the position it belongs to. Because women and men normally and naturally should be equal, with equal opportunities. That's justice within a society. But that is also strategic interest. Because mobilizing half of the human capital is investing and supporting what is in front of us. And we have many challenges. So integrating women potentials in the processes of state development, state challenges, society challenges, world challenges, I believe it's one of the most smart strategic movements of the world. Whether men think like me or us, I don't know. But I believe in the women's potential. I myself witness women, how they really can make it, how they have vision, how they know how to implement the vision, how they are courageous, 
and how they are ready for idealism or for national interest to be even fierceness and fight at any cost. And I'm sure you are doing here in Ukraine because you are having challenges because of destructiveness of your neighboring nation. But I am sure you women today are needed to Ukraine because you can do much more in some areas than men can do because of the women's approaches, connections, outreach at grassroots families, so to help re-bring back United Ukraine, to reintegrate the territories that unfortunately have been challenged. And I am talking to you this because I have done a lot for my country in this respect. So I believe today is really time for you women to engage for the national interest and security challenges of Ukraine, to keep it the state of your dreams because you received or gained independence. You are in democratic path, you are Euro-Atlantic country, now is time for women to show more. One day, when you are well engaged, this your contribution will translate in your political legitimacy, which will empower you even more, and you will be able to challenge paradoxes. Because is it interesting? When times are difficult, there is no barrier for women to be active. There is even no problem of gender discrimination. Once big problems are fixed, aspiration of men for power comes to the place. But at that time, you will defeat that paradox because you already gained that political legitimacy, so no can stand in the way of your empowerment or of our empowerment. So this is very important for this time, and I believe that you are doing, as I'm saying, very vibrant politically, civil society, and even the debate that I heard from you today was inspirational to me, visionary, and I'm sure you will make it. By you making more empowerment, we all get more empowered. Because woman empowerment is a reinforcement process. So if we have women empowered, they become models. doesn't matter if they are in our region or country. It's important to have models that somehow generate amazing force of women moving other women. I'm telling this because it's also my personal history. Like. For example, I was never a politician. I was engineer. However, my country got occupied and I couldn't stand indifferent vis-a-vis -vis that injustice happening to my nation or that oppression or genocide. So I immediately decided, it came kind of a defining moment to me to decide and join the movement for independence. And I unplanned became one of the founders and leaders of the movement for independence of Kosovo. Honestly, didn't have any experience in politics, and I don't justify this man's explanation whether women have or no experience. Because you have to start from somewhere. If the criteria is experience, then we will always remain outside the picture. So I'm telling that I started as non-politically educated. However, this goal or the higher goal made me learn in the terms of learning by doing. 
Shoefi, this has to be also valued that women can learn by doing if there are no capacities for women in say peace negotiations or in other peace processes because as you know we have done quite a good uh, progress in political empowerment when i say this in kosovo for example since the end of the war we have 30 percent of women in parliament and we are constantly present in government i also saw it here and Beyond, however, imagine in the peace processes or in the peace negotiating table, we are in minimal number. Maybe less than 2% seems to be peace negotiators or peace agreement signatories, not to say that in other peace building processes we stay minimal. So, we have or not experience, I think we have to create a way to be there. And there are different ways. One of the very important door opening or breakthrough is to want to do it, to have the will to do it. And that will should come from us, and that will should come from also men to open the doors. Because political will is very important. In case of Kosovo, we women were I would say at all important sectors of the movement, from top leadership to diplomacy, peace negotiation, armed resistance, peaceful resistance, social platform. However, what happened to us after the war? When war ended, we faced the male ambitions for power. And we have put in sidelines of peace building. But did we allow it? No. We used our legitimacy of our essential contribution for independence and freedom of Kosovo and people of Kosovo. Hence, we imposed quota. It's artificial, but it brought us back to the stage. And it will, if challenges are here, I believe that through legitimacy creation you would be able to challenge paradoxes. What happened after that? Quota was not sufficient and is not sufficient because it brings numbers. We worked for quality and we are working. But I think today, not only in Ukraine or Kosovo, worldwide, our fight of women is fight for power. I may sound heavy, but only balance of power between men and women will bring us to the stage and to the roads we deserve and we can implement. Your minister just said, he said, I wanted to help train women for peace building, but Prime Minister didn't support. What, what is happening then? We have to have Prime Minister, woman, so to support. I'm not saying that we should occupy all decision makers. Fair. Edita will put it into declaration. Please. Minister will support this. So, we have really, our struggle is struggle for power, but for balance power, not for domination. We have been enough dominated, we don't want to dominate. Balance of power means first political empowerment of women, which comes also encouraging women to take leadership positions in political parties, in parliament, in government, in local level. So to be able, through being there, in the front lines, decide national policies, fair and gender sensitive. To come to my, back to my story, not only was the one of the leaders of the movement for independence and the only woman, I happen to be even only woman peace negotiator. Not only in the war times, but even now in peace times. 
What I found different of being a woman in this peace negotiations? Two things. First, I pushed very much for agreement to be reached. Because international peace conferences doesn't happen every day. And if you miss the chance, war continues in your country. And if you are the victim side, your people are killed. The aggressor likes to continue with the non disagreement. So I push hard for that. I even picked different examples of failed peace agreements like Palestine, Israel, or like in Croatia there was some forced agreement. So to make aware men, colleagues of delegation, to not miss the opportunity that we signed the peace agreement. And it happened. We signed the agreement. Serbia did not sign the international uh, community, mainly United States as our key ally and NATO intervened to stop the war. What I did second, I know I have to shorten, but I need two, three more things shortly. Second what I did. I helped in our delegation to unite the delegation because we were two factions, armed resistance and peaceful resistance. All were men, ego was high, conflicts between men more for ego than for rational things. I was the one to interfere and help cohesion and unite the delegation from the day one in the Rambouillet conference and then 20 days we functioned rather well. So one of the important role of women is this cohesion role because really women can have more moderate and soft approach and here you prevent men's ego to produce more conflicts than solution. Finally, Maria is waiting for me. I have two more things to say. First, I would like to say that my state, Kosovo, who was born in 2008 and got liberated in 1999 thanks to our movement, but also thanks to the United States and Western partner support is the country of Euro-Atlantic vision and I am here to say that Kosovo stands with Ukraine and we support your independence, sovereignty and territorial integrity and we have aligned with the sanctions against Russia because we think that it was a violation of international law and illegal intervention in Ukraine. Second, would like to say that I'm ready to share my experiences in the future with your minister who is working for reintegration of the territories because I personally worked seven years lately in the Brussels dialogue and can say that we had quite a good success to reintegrate part of the minority of Serbs from the northern part into the Kosovo system and drop the meddling of the neighboring countries. So in the future, hope to come here for these purposes or I invite you to come to Kosovo for this purpose. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, because your speech is really very inspired, and it's really very hard to stop you, because it's very interesting. 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 It's UN peace security issues. She addresses that in high offices and European and is of essence to us, especially when it comes to the critical and complicated things for peace security program for women in the OEC region. Because speakers have told us repeatedly today that based on the OSCE platform, women peace security is not a priority, although the challenges in the continent are mounting.
Дуже дякую. Я на початку скажу, що я дуже рада і з великою честю беру участь на цьому. The gender equality agenda really is, uh, is one of the most important uh, uh, agendas or should be uh, in the OSCE. Uh, I think a lot of work is, is being done, um, but uh, of course there, there is always uh, more to do. Uh, if uh, the gender equality would be advanced more. Якщо we can only imagine далі, uh, when women would be more uh, empowered uh, politically and economically and in the justice sector, uh, what the, the region, uh, this region would, uh, would, it would mean uh, for the well-being and, uh, and the success and development of, of, the, of the region. Uh, but, uh, here today I will speak uh, more as Madam Moderator Але said about uh, Resolution 1325. Uh, as, you, as you know, this is, знаєте, it's about gender equality, це про gender but uh, as we have heard earlier, it's uh, really more about operational effectiveness in peace and security, to have better peace and more peace, and to have better security and, and more security. Um, it's uh, also very important to, to recognize it's called women, peace and security, but perhaps it should be called gender, peace and security, it's really uh, both uh, men and women should be, should be working towards gender equality. Um, uh, the Resolution 1325 is also very important to emphasize how important it is that also men should be working towards gender equality. It's very important to speak uh, 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 for uh, this uh, agenda because it concerns them just as much. One of the, uh, one of the instruments that uh, can be used uh, in forwarding uh, this agenda is uh, the national action plans. And uh, Ukraine uh, has one. I have heard today that it's everything is, well, not everything, but so many things are very slow here and, uh, and uh, not uh, going forward. But uh, that's not what I, what I take from when I have heard at the international uh, uh, meetings, uh, uh, Ukraine has really done a wonderful job uh, in f and very fast uh, in forwarding and implementing the, the national action plan. Uh, so, so, um, we should also remember when things are going well, and we're always, women especially, are always striving forward, and we're never pleased, uh, but we should also recognize when, when we have done something well. And uh, now, uh, in, in Ukraine, you are uh, doing what some, what some countries are doing, uh, namely developing uh, regional. Uh, local action plans. So, I, 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 as far as I understand, in five or plus, uh, these uh, regional action plans are being developed. Uh, in Finland, also, we are uh, working. Just have just adopted uh, a new one, and uh, part of our uh, one of our priorities in the OSCE has been a uh, region-wide, an OEC action plan. Uh, so together with some other countries, we have been promoting this for many years. It still uh, has not uh, come through, and, uh, uh, but we will continue working on it. And uh, if we, without uh, an OEC action plan uh, or with it, uh, I think we should Keep working on all the all the subjects of uh, all the areas and topics of uh, the women, peace, and security agenda. So today, uh, now we have heard very valuable in, got valuable in, insights into the security sector, uh, the military crisis management, but there is also civilian crisis management where there has to be more women, and uh, we have to uh, have national uh, women. Uh, first, uh, for example, in border control, in the justice sector, that we can then send to these uh, operations. Uh, on peace processes, um, well, there's a lot I could say, but I think uh, in, in, uh, to, to save some time, I, I, I won't say it, but, but um, we know now that when women participate, their, their likelihood is much higher, that there will be an agreement in the first place, and then also that it will last uh, 
longer. Um, and um, uh, at the moment, there are uh, uh, women's mediator networks being created in different regions, and these networks uh, then uh, uh, sh uh, should uh, cooperate. And, uh, and this is important to, to participate in this because uh, the local Everybody who has got uh, who has got experience themselves from uh, participating in a, in a peace process should obviously be there, and uh, it should be documented uh, 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 what what has been uh, working and uh, what should be improved. But there are there are there is a, a there are many topics uh, in in women, peace, and security that uh, could uh, could be. Uh, worked on in the OSCE context, uh, there is disarmament, there is prevention of violent extremism, uh, uh, sexual violence in conflict, uh, and uh, human rights, uh, women human rights defenders, and, and so on. Uh, so, um, uh, and then just to, to um, round off, uh, uh, emphasizing the importance of civil uh, society for this agenda. Uh, we won't get anywhere uh, without the active uh, involvement of, of uh, civilian, uh, civil society and, and uh, civil society organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Я хотіла би сказати, що дійсно ви говорили про національні інтереси. Ми дуже дякуємо за ті позитивні слова, які зміни відбулися в Україні. Але все ж таки, ми можемо зробити декларацію для ОСІ мембрів Штатів. It's important to have the women's lobby. It all will be done in persons of the Resolution 1335, Women, Peace, Security, in light of the developments in Moldova, Georgia, Ukraine, and elsewhere, so that we could voice these concerns. And before I'm going to turn over to the acting director of the UNDP in the Ukraine, I'd like to make a blitz quiz of a kind. It concerns international success stories of women's involvement in peace processes across the globe. Do you think there is still a stereotype suggesting that it's not the women's business or cause? It is still an open question. Do you think we're going to be able to overcome this stereotype across the world? Let's get started with Edith. А я думаю, що найскладніше в будь-яких реформах це саме зміна культури. Можна прагнути правих реформ, можна виступати за імплементацію і організацію. The, the political culture among the men world, not only in my region, in the Balkans, or here, but it seems even worldwide, is quite not open to accept women in its full importance and uh, acknowledge the woman potential for the better future of the world. So this is challenging. Changing culture requires a lot of work in partnership, men and women together. Thank you. На початку були більш оптимістичні. You were more optimistic earlier on. Двадцять перше століття, я казала. Це наше століття, я не казала двадцять один в плані чогось іншого. I think we're going to witness the success. Minister, what would you say? Uh, are there still any stereotypes out there? And then how to overcome them? So two questions in one. Well, certainly they have to be overcome. There might be just lack of understanding, but I think the awareness raising campaign 
is done here and there, and it actually changes the mindsets of people, their attitude to this issue in many ways. It's not the only thing where the change is required. So I guess the awareness raising campaign and education really matter. I remember when I was a high school kid, a class would be broken into groups, some people would do some handicrafts and stuff, others would go and get some cooking skills. So we need to achieve the changes in the understanding. And it's not just about security sector. In the security sector you get lots of components, service, occupying particular positions, social inequality, or equality, equal access to professions, getting trained, no matter if you're a woman or a man. Is this all changing? I think it is. And many people became a part of this endeavor, so even those who don't believe it will see it happen. International practices clearly suggest that's the way to go. And we're going to keep on this way, fighting the stereotypes, aiding the cause. Yes, that's what we're doing. Okay, Irina, could you possibly address 1325 from your experience? Thank you. Changing mentality, approaches and practices really takes time. First and foremost, in order to succeed, we have to gain education. Our kids have to be able to understand what is this gender equality. Vadim speaks from his high school experience. My daughter came back home once, she was a 10th grader, and she says, Mom, girls are supposed to take courses in medical services and boys are supposed to take a military training course. I'd like to join the group of boys taking a military training course. And they told them, you're free to choose. Nobody taught her that, but She has gained that understanding, and uh, the future generation will look at those things differently. Whatever is a stereotype to men of my generation and older men, maybe slightly younger men, maybe it's not going to be that much of a stereotype for forthcoming generations, our sons and kids. So it's an evolutionary pathway, and education helps make it happen. The communication component is also found in that and it matters pretty much. We don't need to wait for 30 years for the kids to grow up, so we're going to try and get things done right now. Right now we can try and change practices. We may change laws, but that's not the whole thing. Apart from them, Apart from that, we have to change practices. We have to review job descriptions of all incumbents that are tiers in the security and defense sectors and elsewhere. And some of the responsibility should be taken to keep the gender equality in place. The training system should allow them to learn about the tools they can employ. And all of these things today can lead to results. And speaking of the gender advisors, the minister was saying he would like to have a feminine deputy, and that's classy, I like that. I wish for that to happen. But we do not understand what those gender advisors are going to be doing. In the Ministry of the Interior, in persons of 1325, we began involving gender advisors, and the Ministry of the Interior has been the leader in this process, and we would like for the Ministry of Defense to be a part of that as well. This gender advisor can help draft procedures and job descriptions, which will become mandatory, binding, and that's going to be a change of practices, and then the approach will change. The Ukraine is one of the few countries which has got a national action plan in persons of Resolution 1325, and that's a big deal. 
I appreciate the Ministry of Social Policy. Back in 2016, they spearheaded the idea of drafting this plan. Natalia Fedorovich, the then Minister of Social Policy and her team have drafted this piece and brought it to the government. Now we need to see where we did good, where we didn't do so good. That's the national plan till 2020. So we need to involve the Ministry of Temporal Occupied Territories in fulfilling the plan and then move on. Thank you. You have been focused on the Ukraine for the most part, but what I was saying is that these stereotypes are there in the world. So, and Sophie, is this still an open question to you as well? And you're actively involved in combating the stereotype. Мы жили сотни або тисячі років у патріархальному суспільстві. Я не думаю, що все зміниться отак одразу, але все таки зміни є. Вони відбуваються. Що стосується миротворчих процесів, то якщо поглянути на різні види діалогу, є національний, є один шлях, інший шлях діалогу. І якщо йдеш цим шляхом, то тоді розумієш, що робити. От пані Тахір, вона поділилася своїм досвідом, наприклад. Я гадаю, що все змінюється і у нас у Фінляндії на власному житті я бачив, що мій дідусь, наприклад, він не розумівся на гендерній рівності. Батько краще про це розумів, брат ще краще, тепер мої діти, мої сини. Вони ж зовсім по-іншому відносяться до гендерної рівності. І вони дивляться жіночий футбол. Ну і таке інше. А такого раніше не бувало навіть з моїми братами. Отже, щось рухається. I'd like now to turn over to Ms. Ivan Guyen, the acting director of the UNDP office in the Ukraine. Дякую. Я хотіла б поздоровити спочатку всіх організаторів. And today and tomorrow, um, it is so inspiring to to hear all the stories from Ukraine as well as, as uh, from uh, from other countries in the world. Um, talking about the women, peace, and uh, security, I I also would like to pick up what we have just said here with the panel is that when we talk about the changing the mindset, talking about the social norms, talking about the stereotype, it is so universal. It's so universal. And therefore, the challenges are shared. And if we want to address those challenges, we really need to come together, act together, because without this, we cannot address those challenges. And change happens by acting together and working together. So this um, first point I would like to make. Uh, secondly, is that when we are talking about women, peace and security, we talk about their right. And we also know that they have a role to play and they have a very important role to play. So giving people, the op women, the opportunity to play their role, to be participating in the peace processes is a, it's very, very important. I, and, and I'm so inspired to see so many women uh, who are in the armed forces and I would really feel like uh, this is this is our future and this is the future of 21st century. Um, I would like to also concur to my colleagues Anastasia from UN Women uh, when she was talking um, to, to appreciate all the, uh, all the stuff that the government and the parliament uh, in Ukraine are doing uh, to advance the agenda um, of the UN Resolution 1325. Uh, we, we acknowledge it and as the first, um, as the um, vice 
uh, Prime Minister has been saying, this is a big thing that Ukraine has an action plan. Um, now, a lot of work still needs to be done, that's that we all agree. Uh, I also agree with the panelists from Kosovo who said that um, it's not only about the number, it's all about the quality. But I, I also believe that before we talk about the quality, we have to give the number first. So therefore, having more women into, in, in, into the peace processes, into all those um, uh, processes that, 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 that are important for women to raise their voice, because, not because we want to have higher numbers, but because we bring to the table something that men don't. And therefore, it's important for us to have the number. So finally, I would like to encourage uh, all the panelists and other people today and tomorrow to be very specific about exactly what we can do, what we can bring into to, to the discussion, to agree on what would, be, what would be the next step. We need to walk the talk. We talk a lot already, so need to talk. Finally, on behalf of the UN, um, together with the UN family, UNDP stand ready to work with you, to cooperate with you and the government and the parliament and all the stakeholder civil society to advance this agenda forward. Thank you very much Thank for giving you. me an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. План – це важливо, але найскладніше – це реалізація і імплементація. Я дякую спікерам. І зараз ми переходимо, звертаюся до залу на ваші запитання. Будь ласка, ось запитання. I'd like to respond to your quiz. I represent International Women's League for Peace and Freedom. I'd like to speak about stereotypes and women's involvement in peace processes. It is known that women are worst hit by the conflicts and they are willing to put an end to the conflict more than anybody else. They want to diminish the consequences of that. May I get your question, please? We all agree that women have to be more involved in activities, political and peace processes. But just one tiny detail. If a woman becomes a part of the infrastructure which supports the reproductive infrastructure like hospitals, kindergartens and schools, That does not allow her to take active part in something else. She does not have time for that. Give me the question, come on. So you spoke of education. You say that there is a need to raise a new generation. But we have to take care of kindergartens to feed the children there adequately. And if some kids have to stay there for a longer time, they should be well fed anyway. And that's going to be something that we can do quickly and efficiently. When we speak of the peace process, I don't think what you say has something to do with that. And second thing, it's about offering more child care services. Because right now, we're not doing this adequately enough. If there is a parent and a baby in a disadvantaged background, then it's a problem. They have to be taken care of. Well, thank you for sharing this. There is one more question coming up. Your question, please. Oksana Potapova, civil activist. I spent the last couple of years working with the communities through arts and participatory studies. We look into the needs of women affected by the conflict. We also look into the potential of peacemaking, like reducing tension, offering better education. Maria was saying about the need to 
have women present on either side of the conflict, and I took part in some initiatives which bring together mostly women and other activists between Russia and Ukraine. They take part in the dialogue projects and projects based on exchange of experience. And I consider in this country public events may be jeopardized by Ukrainians themselves, because these people believe that they've got a good idea of patriotism, and if events are attended by Russian nationals, then it is something against this country, it is something anti-patriotic, although to me it's a part of peace process. So here is my question to you. As far as I can see, these are typically the people that frustrate those events and uh, they really spin out of control, they get hysterical, but they go unpunished. I mean, they think they're doing something good for their home country, but they are not. So what do you think of that? Maybe it's a matter of inland security in terms of peace processes in the country. If it's true, then what do you think we should do to enable better space for the dialogue so that different ideas could be addressed inside this country? Thank you. I think we're going to get more comments from the minister first. It's wrong to say that everybody in Russia are against in the Ukraine, and they are all the same. It's like in the uncontrolled territories, they are just like that. It's just a very simplistic way of looking at things, but it's not really true. Let's see what's happening. They want us to be split into factions, groups, territorially or otherwise, or gender-wise. Anything goes. And uh, I know what you're talking about. So some of these people would participate in elections, but they would not win. But it's just the way they see things and their idea of what they should do. But there are certain hazards, dangers. If it's a truly a dialogue, which is about building peace, establishing ties, and then Ukraine can have a say in the process instead of being just affected by the process. That's one thing. So in such a dialogue, we should not legalize the imposters, which seem to speak for the government which is under control of the Russian Federation. So it takes preparation for the dialogue to take an appropriate shape. And the preparation should be done by the people who know everything about this process. Then there's going to be no problem. Right now in the Ukraine, I'm not speaking for the government. I'm speaking for the civil society. And that's where a lot of dialogues are happening. Not too many people know about that. And uh, if we are well trained and seasoned in that, well, we are smarter than what somebody else abroad might think, primarily in Russia. So if you do this job the right way, then we're going to affect the processes that are beneficial to us. If we're going to keep simplifying everything like there are only two options, then it's going to be the wrong pathway. And lastly, the Ukraine in the Kiev Polytechnical Institute started a special course on conflict management and mediation, and we try to gather world's best practices to see how it gets done. Not in all advanced countries do they exhibit such a course. NGOs should be a part of the entire system in this whole process, then it's going to pay off. Thank you. Just wrapping up this discussion, and I apologize. We or getting a drift of the schedule again. I'd like to say that we are now experiencing a new wave of inspiration among women in all areas of life. And uh, it's gratifying to see all of the panelists appreciating women's role in peace building. And this discussion has shown us that it is indeed important to be able to learn from international practices and to support women in the military to address their issues. I really appreciate all of the panelists and questions from the audience, and I'll see you around. Thank you.
пані Марії Іоновій. Дякуємо за модерацію дискусії. Оголошується перерва на каву. Наступна дискусійна платформа «Втомилися мовчати. Запобігання та протидія гендерно обумовленому насильству проти жінок» розпочнеться через 10 хвилин. Чекаємо на вас в цій залі. Шановні гості, просимо вас не затримуватися. Ми розпочнемо за 10 хвилин. Thank you. 